All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, just some quick announcements before we have two speakers tonight. First of all, Stream Explorer, June 8th at 9 a.m. at uh, Sprague Park. We'll be meeting to uh, do some pond fishing with uh, Jim's group. So everyone's welcome. If you want to bring a friend, a family member, come on down. This Saturday, the Trout Festival is being held in Caledonia, New York. Um, it starts at 10 a.m.? Nine. Nine. It runs right through 10 at night. Yeah. Uh, they've got bands. They've got uh, live entertainment. Tom Rosenbauer from the Orvis Corporation is will be on site prior to that. Uh, just probably yes. as a booth or something. And then at 2 p.m., he's doing a presentation at uh, one of the local church halls. Yeah, the Presbyterian Church on Main Street, yeah. which is a little bit from the site, but... And I heard that they originally were going to have him do a string presentation, but they had to uh, put the kibosh on it because there were 300 people that were signed up and they didn't know where to put everybody. So he's going to do his presentation uh, right in town there. Um, Project Healing Waters next meeting will be sometime in June. And just stay uh, connected to our uh, social media and uh, our next newsletter, and you'll find that date and time. Uh, we are sending two people to the uh, State uh, Shroud Unlimited uh, Trout Camp on the Delaware River at the end of June, and one of the participants here is uh, Ryan uh, Bennett, and uh, uh, another uh, member of the Stream Explorers, Bailey Burke. She'll be joining uh, you. And uh, thanks, Jim. I mean, through your group, I mean, we've really been able to do this the first time in many, many years. So I uh, hope you really enjoy yourself, and I'm sure you're going to learn. And I'm actually envious that I'm not going, but uh, Ken will be a mentor fishing with you guys. Uh, the West Wiscoy Elbro project will be done this summer. We're in the final stages, or I should say, the New York DEC of approving the um, the award of forty nine thousand six hundred dollars to uh, begin work. Uh, we received a grant from the uh, Fisheries Enhancement Fund for $4,700 to purchase materials. And we're in the process of uh, you know, estimating materials, rebar, stone, trees, et cetera. Um, this will be the last general meeting of the year. So it's been a great year and thanks for everybody for coming on down. I know we had some days where the weather wasn't the best, but uh, we got through it. And uh, we're good, like I mentioned, we're going to have two speakers. Ken Kanicki is going to start off. Ken was uh, at the uh, Northeast Trout Unlimited uh, Rendezvous in the beginning of May in Vermont. And uh, I'm excited to hear what he has to say and, and all the good things that happened. And I'll give the group an update. And then after that, Mr. John Miller from the Lackawanna Middle School will be doing um, a presentation on their uh, the eleventh year, right, John? Right. On the yeah. Trout in the Classroom program, and uh, it's really been a really good success. It's just one of eleven schools that I think Chuck Godfrey is is running this year. Uh, and with that, uh, Brian Erie County Fair. Yes, we have. Lots open for Erie County Fair for the 12 days that it's open, mm -hmm. August 7th to the 18th. We have two shifts, one run from 11 o'clock, 4.30, and the second shift from 4.30 to 10 o'clock at night. If anybody wants to sign up and volunteer, free parking, free, free, free tickets for the event. And then you want to sign up for anything, just give me a call or text me and uh, let me know if you want. Know, or I'd like to know if you want to give me a call or something like that. Yeah, uh, we'd appreciate any help. It's it's a long run at the fair, like twelve days, and uh, we've got a, a a lot of a lot of time slots and hours to fill. But uh, it, it, it's it's enjoyable, and it, like you said, you get into the fair free. You want to do a half a day, bring your family to meet you there, and then you can spend the rest of the day at the fair. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ken. 
just want to mention to everybody oh. that we are recording it on Zoom so that way we can upload it to our YouTube channel um, so people can see this out. So we just want to point out. Focus, Way to end the year, Bill. I forgot to mention in every meeting. Okay. Yes, I got you. <laughs> no, I think everyone should be able to hear me. Yep. Are you good? Uh, the first thing I, I want to thank, I don't know how many people know, I got really sick after I went to this, was in the hospital for a couple of days, and a lot of people said, I hope you're feeling better, and I really appreciate it. And everyone, a bunch of people that saw me here said, great to see you here and we, we're glad you're up. My voice is still a little like weird because when I was there, I got intubated. It was great going in, but coming out was not good. So my voice is kind of weird, but I feel great. Thanks for everyone's uh, kind words there. Uh, yeah, w the uh, Northeast Rendezvous, the thing came out in February and I saw it was Arlington, Vermont. And I knew where that was. It's right next to Manchester where Orvis is. And I said, boy, we should go. And my wife, who she doesn't like traveling or fly fishing, was like, okay, let's go. We'll find a really nice place to stay. So we stayed at the Arlington Inn. This is actually behind the inn. This inn is beautiful, 1836 building. It's in beautiful condition. And we were wondering where the, uh, the whole event was gonna be. It, it was actually like 150 feet away from where we stayed. So we were just walking across the grass. Um, one of the best things about this is many of the people from Trout Unlimited, sort of regionally and nationally, who I have, some people I've talked to on the phone, a few I had met, a lot of people, there's been email conversation or uh, a quick text. I got to meet everyone. This, there was 181 people um, from all over the East Coast, Carolina. There were people there from Georgia who had come up for it. Um, so it was, yeah, a really great meeting. And a lot of the people that I had like talked to before, but I finally got to meet. So that's where we stayed. This is the, uh, it was beautiful breakfast at this morning room. Um, and then, that was a big selling point for my wife. They had banana split breakfast, like banana with yogurt and berries and stuff. She was like, this is okay. <laughs> you go fishing, I'm good. It was uh, the Trout Unlimited part of this was held in conjunction with the Bat and Kill Fly Fishing Festival. So a lot of the events were held right in the same spot, this community center, which again was 200 feet away. I would just walk across the grass. So I was over there all the time talking to different people, meeting uh, people nationally. Uh, Kyle's not here. This is, we went for dinner with Kyle and uh, his girlfriend, Kira. And that was the other big selling point for my wife's like, oh, we get to go out for a really nice dinner. <laughs> this is this hill farm. It's all farm to table. The food was spectacular. It was, we, we sat inside there. The sun came down. It was beautiful. And this is when we were leaving. Uh, finally, after a, there was quite a bit of cocktailing that night. Um, the peepers, it was so loud. I've never heard anything like it. It was actually hard to talk to anyone out in the parking lot. It was that loud. The, these bugs were just like, going off, so. Uh, this is a guy I was fishing with on the Woolamsock, which is about 13 miles from where we stayed. Some of the guys in Orvis said, that's the place to go. They stock it, there's some wild fish in that. And yeah, he caught a really nice, that's about a 16 inch or so brown trout. And it was very odd. The fish was really, really pink on the belly. And we, we couldn't really figure out what it was, if it was the food source there or the alkalinity of the water. Um, the water up there, again, this was May 3rd, the water was still pretty cold. It was 50 degrees. Again, there's breakfast. There's the guy, he netted a fish. There he is fishing. But yeah, that's this is where I was 
and those covered bridges, there was a whole bunch of those there in Vermont. The, the Bat Kill, there's 11 of them that cross over in a lot of spots. So very picturesque. I took one nice fish there. Um, and like in Vermont, you know, in Buffalo or the Western New York area, New York State, there's uh, the signs go up, the white signs. Some there's still yellow signs on some of the trees, and at some uh, parking lots, like at the Owatka parking lot, there's a little uh, thing that talks about special regs. In Vermont, they have these set up at all the uh, where there's public access and parking, so you could figure out where you were, what were the regulations, what kind of fish you were could expect to see. Again, more covered bridges. Um, I would highly recommend. Uh, next year, they're talking about doing this up in the Catskills at the Catskill Fly Fishing Museum, where I've done it before. If it, if it happens again, I would recommend everyone go. Interesting subjects, Kyle gave talks, Tom Rosenbauer gave talks. Uh, there, were, there were people talking about uh, vintage uh, fly equipment. There are people selling bamboo rods. Made, they got made bamboo rods, um, yeah, vintage reels, all kinds of great stuff there. There was also local beer, local wineries, local distilleries right there on the site, beautiful tented area. So uh, some of the people that you might know, Dave Agnes, who's the president of Seth Green, and his wife, Lindsay, they were there, Tracy Brown, who, is in charge of uh, stream restoration for the whole Northeast. We're there. Uh, Tracy and I had spoken on the phone and I met her once before for like two minutes, but we had like a 30 minute conversation because there was, oh, we're having a beer. Let's sit down and talk. John Shaner was there. there were, uh, Mike Valla, uh, you might not know who Mike Valla is. He wrote books about John Atherton but the thing I was most interested in, when he was a, a youngster, he actually stayed at the Jetties in the Catskills in their upstairs bedroom. He like spent his summers when he was 12, 13, and 14 at their house. So he knew all about them. And one of the grandkids was there. And I actually, I don't know what made me do this. I brought one of my books that Eric Liza wrote about the Duddies. And it was actually for my dad. Eric and my dad actually fished the Genesee River. So it was all like, Eric wrote this really nice thing to like my father. And then when we went to the Catskills, we got Walt, Winnie and Mary to all sign. So this book I have is like a one-on-one. And I showed it to Mike Valla and he was almost like in tears, like, oh my God, I spent all those summers with those people, they were like my family. Uh, so yeah, meeting a lot of great people up there. Uh, a lot of good information too. Uh, they talked about some of the stream restoration that they're doing on the bat and kill. The last day on that Sunday, we actually, it was raining and it sort of worked out nicely because they did a tree planting on the bat and kill right behind where Orvis was. So a bunch of people went over there and you know how we, we go ahead and do some tree planting and that. So aside from just talking about it, there was also um, that. There was also some stream cleanups that they did in the one parking lot that was very close on the bat kill that got a lot of pressure. There was people there and they, they did a big stream cleanup, took out about 20 bags of garbage, which is always great to see. So highly recommend that if uh, you ever get a chance to go to one of these, uh, Northeast rendezvous, uh, very worth your time. I had a great time. I can't wait till next year so we can go back. Any questions? Uh, when I was at Orvis, in fact, I met the other Adam, incredibly enough, he and I showed up at, from Buffalo, he drove in, I drove in and we met at the Orvis shop there. Um, I did not go to the, uh, the rod area, but I went to, 
uh, the real area. It was actually open when I was there. Uh, the rod area, they were actually taking people through in groups, and I wasn't in the group. It's kind of nice, so the, in Manchester, Orvis is there. The American Museum of Fly Fishing is right next to it. You can park at Orvis, walk over there. The reel and rod manufacturing is right behind that building, and next to it is an Orvis outlet where we we did some shopping there. I did some shopping at the regular Orvis store. I got this <laughs> air caster, which I'd been sort of looking for for a while. So, mm, oh no, I have enough rods. Yeah, I have enough rods. But highly recommend it if you ever get a chance to go. I had a blast. Um, the setup there was really spectacular that we were so close in that. The one thing I'll say, the fishing on the Bat Hill was not very good, and that was generally what everyone said. There's a lot of fish that are big, so the, the best fishing there is like with bigger streamers and that. So the one night I went out, it was like, oh, there's going to be Hendrickson Spinnerfall, and it's like, this is great. Thousands of flies. There was one fish feeding. I actually got it. It was like a seven inch brown trout so but i was like wow this many flies should have been a lot of action but there wasn't beautiful area though had a great time Thanks for representing us. Yeah. turn it over to jen I've used one of these drills, so if you want to give me any guidance, you can. I'll go with it. Sorry for that. All right, we got our HDMI. Oh. Don't think of. And share screen, Bill. Yeah. No. No, but I got his jersey. I waited till they uh, traded him. <laughs> I got it cheaper. <laughs> yeah. I got Von Miller's jersey, too. It's nice having your own name on the back. All right. Okay, cool. All right, good. Let me just uh, put that up here. And we should be good. So what is interesting is... There we go. That should do it. All right. Yeah, so I teach at uh, Lackawanna Middle School. I'm a middle school science teacher. I've taught in the high school as well. I had about five years I was crossing over. Our middle school and our high school are connected. That wasn't fun, though, running between the buildings. So last six years or so, exclusively middle school. Um, and I teach life science, biology. So this fits right in. Um, I heard about the Trout in the Classroom program when I was starting a fishing club about 11 years ago. Took me a few years to get traction with administration to give me permission to start the fishing club. And uh, so I start going to some local sportsman's meetings. Uh, Erie County Federation's a sportsman's club. Met Chuck Godfrey. I was looking for some donations to get some rod and reels to get started on the fishing club. And we've been going strong for 11 years with that. And then Chuck introduced me to this idea of trout in the classroom. Now, for me, it... It was definitely something I was intrigued by. I felt like I, all right, it's going to be funny. Let's see. All right, so there we go. I guess that worked. Um, you know, I'm a fisherman, multi-species. I love musky fishing, but fly fishing and trout and perch and bass and walleye and wherever I travel, I got a travel rod with me. Um, I love fishing. So uh, the idea of raising trout was interesting, but I also have bred various tropical fish species like those, uh, Cyphocalypia gibberosa there, short name MOBA, 
Uh, I've bred a lot of different species over the years. So raising brown trout just seemed like a no brainer to me. And it was something I was interested in. But I kind of put it on the back burner a little bit and thought about it because I had my hands full getting the fishing club started. But I jumped into it. And now we're going 11 years strong of uh, raising and releasing brown trout and running a fishing club. Uh, so bringing kids, you know, urban district, giving them unique opportunities that a lot of them just simply don't have and never get involved with afterwards. It's kind of interesting to me on the fishing club thing. And, you know, you, you get rods and reels and gear into the kids' hands and you teach them how to use it and you take them out and they use it and they love it. And then you hope that you planted that seed and they're going to get out there and fish. But then I bump into these kids in the high school and they're like, Mr. Miller, when are you going to take me fishing again? Yeah. I'm like, well, it's a middle school club, but how have you been getting out? In most cases, it's been they haven't, you know. Some of those kids, you know, they got fishing families to get out, but some don't. So anyhow, uh, the trout has been great, though. Trout in the classroom. This is our initial setup. As you can see, I use a 75-gallon aquarium. I know a lot of the other uh, schools are using maybe 55 gallons, I think, or even 30, right? So we use a 75-gallon aquarium. We got the chiller unit. You can see, uh, thank you for that equipment and the, the filtration that was provided. Uh, we started out, like you could see, the insulation on it uh, fully enclosed until the fish were fully developed. Um, kind of got away from that in the last few years. Um, we used to take this cover off, and the kids with this was a little trap door here. They could peel back this little piece of the, the brown trout skin, and it opens up a peekaboo door where the egg basket is. Um, but I transitioned to just leaving that piece off pretty much. And it's still insulated around the bottom, the back, and the sides. Probably a little bit more work on the chiller unit, but I think the trade-off's worth it. Uh, one of the things we definitely like to decorate the tank, you know, make it kind of look as realistic as possible, let the algae grow in the back. Roots, uh, rocks, caves, try to make it a little natural environment, kind of, you can see some student art there. We also have a couple of baby snapping turtles we're raising and some baby MOBA fish that I showed you earlier that I brought in from home, just giving kids something to look forward to coming into the classroom, I find. You know, if they have a reason to come running into the science classroom, like what's going on with, you know, the fish, what's going on with the turtles, you know, did the fish, did the eggs hatch yet? Just that hook you need to get kids excited about coming to class. So Trout in the Classroom does that for us in, in a big way. Um, this particular chiller unit we use, I know there's a lot of types out there, I think they call it drop-in with the stainless steel tubing there on the side of the tank. It just hooks onto the side and it's nice. It's got the thermostat. You just set it to whatever temperature you like. We usually start out with 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And as the spring pro uh, progresses, I kind of bump it up to 52 and then ultimately 54. Um, and that's just something I added to it. Hopefully trying to just a little bit more warmth, hopefully get them growing a little faster before release. Just talking to Chuck, he's telling me he's got some schools that have just uh, raised like five inches. I'm like, ooh, five, and you know, even bigger. So the biggest we've gotten them is about four and a quarter inches, you know, on the on the uh, measuring tape. Uh, but a lot of them are smaller than that when we release. So some of the filtration we run, um, you know, Prax Air Trout Unlimited donated this uh, AquaClear 100, and I was excited about that because. I've kept a lot of aquariums. I've bred a lot of fish over the years, and I love this type of filter. It's fantastic. It's easy to use. But year one, we didn't have a big release number. Year one, I think we released 36 fish. And the reason being is uh, this. I added that little clip piece there, that picture, but we just had your uptake tubing, and it you know had some pretty big holes in there, like big slats that the small fish could fit right into. And I come in from the one weekend shortly after they hatched, and I'm like, there's noticeably less fish. What's going on? Start taking apart the filter and mashed up little brown trout in the impeller back in here. So the fix to that was on the uplift tube uh, foam filter. It gives you a little bit more biological filtration and mechanical filtration. Most importantly, it protects the fish. It will get clogged up with small debris, um, and you'll see the flow rate coming out of the the filter it's reduced and of course it's time to rinse that externally and get it back in there so that was a little tweak we made and we start releasing a lot more fish after making that small tweak and Chuck I don't know if you're familiar 
Has anyone else had that issue of fish getting caught into the filtration? Several or eight years ago, first time it started showing up on that Nashville cat group. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. And even when I'm rinsing out that little pre filter, I'll just put a net over there so the net gets suctioned against it. The fish can't get sucked in while I'm doing a little maintenance. <laughs> Live and learn, you know. We so we're running this uh, aqua clear unit. Like I said, it's a box filter, pulls the water up, it goes through filter media like foam and, and uh, you know, and, and carbon and whatever else. Um, we're also running an internal filter. Uh, that's actually suctioned down into the tank, but it adds more aeration. And uh, of course, the air pump with some uh, air stones, additional oxygenation, additional current for the trout, just kind of got currents going all over in that water. And it's great. It's fun watching those trout position themselves into the current. It's pretty cool, natural way to look at it. You know, the, what we look forward to every year, right around the third week of October is, you know, Chuck delivering the eggs to us, you know, and been doing this so long. I used to have brown hair when we were doing this <laughs> and, and it's, this tank has been in several rooms. Uh, I think right now, are we in the third or the fourth, the third room uh, that the tank's been moved around. The district has kind of moved me between different buildings and the tank keeps following through, but the kids look forward to that day that, you know, one of the eggs coming, one of the eggs coming and then trout uh, Chuck gives us the schedule. So we get the approximation of when it'll arrive. Sometimes it's during a class. And the kids, you know, we stop what we're doing. Okay, the eggs are here. And everybody gathers around and watches the eggs get dumped into the egg net. Sometimes it's during my lunch or a PD. And all right, no kids around. And hence me dropping them in that time with the little insulated container. Obviously, that picture was taken some time ago. So that's a big day for us. Sometimes the eggs show up. You got a few that are already hatched. Um, sometimes the eggs show up and... You got a few that are already fungus. Fungus is a microorganism that absolutely likes to find your eggs that either didn't get fertilized or, you know, got knocked around in the process. Who knows what led to it? But, uh, and then, of course, sometimes just all the eggs are viable. I don't know why I'm having a little bit of a hard time with this. Switching. What's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We've seen that. Me and you, Chuck, have experienced that together. Uh, and here's, you know, here's a picture of some of our eggs starting to hatch. You know, that's about this particular picture I recall was taken five days after they arrived, after Chuck dropped them off. Uh, this is approximately double that about 10 days in you can see their yolk sacs are kind of becoming a little more streamlined um this is about the stage where yeah they're they're moving around more they're looking more active and you know when they arrive typically you could see the egg dots the little spines rolled up in there you know the guys at the hatchery are making sure they're they're really close to the hatching before they send them off to the schools and we keep them in the egg basket number one that was recommended to us but it makes a lot of sense um, and when they initially start feeding, we want to have give them a couple, two, three days to observe them feeding, make sure they can find the trout chow, which is a size zero, little powder floating around in a current. They, you watch them, they start coming up and grabbing it. And once we know they can identify what their food source is, um, and they've been eating for several days, and we're, you can see their little transparent bellies when they're filling up. And at that point, okay, we're comfortable releasing them into the 75 gallon aquarium with a lot more current, a lot more decor and uh this is going to drive me nuts if i have to hit that button so many times but i'll do it um you know what uh, he retired now but one of our art teachers is a really good photographer too so he was in the high school but a couple times over i got him to come over and help us take some photos and the better photos were from him and the not so great photos are from my phone and i'll tell you what it is a challenge taking a picture of these fish with the glass and windows in the room and everything else and some rooms were more conducive to it than others the room i'm in right now not very conducive to it or at least the location of the aquarium but here you can see some of the pigmentation coming in you know when you're looking at these live sometimes we'll take them we got this document camera we could put them in a petri dish right out of the tank and 
project and zoom in on them. So you can project at just that size with the live specimen in front of us and the little heart beating and the gills moving and the kids dig it. And uh, here you go. This is pretty much what they look like when they're going to start eating. At this point, the little Alvin start shooting to the surface. They touch the surface. They settle back down. It's time to start feeding them, you know. And uh, like I said, we'll give them at least a good solid three days, depending on what happens with the the day of the week and going into the weekend, maybe we'll give them a couple days after the weekend and then we release them. So, and hey, uh, jump in with any questions you have along the way. Nothing formal here, easy going. Any questions you have, stop me please, if you got them. That's a great question and there's a lot of variables. Like I mentioned that filtration issue, that certainly cost us that year out of 100 eggs estimated, we only released 36, that was year one though. We're typically, and I, and I wish I had a graph here with some real hard data for you. But I'll tell you what, there's been a, it, it's gone up every year, really. Um, the following year, I know the second year we released about 69. And then we were in the 80s for a few years. Then, you know, they estimate they're giving you 100. And I usually ask Chuck, like, hey, if you can get a couple more, do it. So he's sometimes uh, the little measuring device they use was a little overflowing. So we've released over 100 fish a couple times in a row during the COVID years too. So the kids weren't with me for the release, field trips around the kibosh. And, you know, I was taking them and releasing them myself, but 116 the one year, 108 the other. That was pretty good. Especially when they tell you, you give a hundred eggs, right? Um, and this year, you know, Chuck brought us uh, 200 eggs. So we, we did something we haven't normally done this year is we released 75 of the, uh, of the young fish on Earth Day in April this year. And we did that as part of the Ladders to the Outdoor program. Um, I'll talk to you in a little bit about, you know, our procedure for releasing them and what we do with that day. But ultimately, it was very similar to what Ladders to the Outdoors was doing. They're getting a bunch of schools together. They're going to do a beach cleanup, which is what we've always done anyhow. So we decided to join forces with them, with our students, and uh, did a beach sweep, released 75 fish. And then, you know, third week of May, which is more traditional, release the rest of them, uh, an additional 91 fish. So that takes us up to what, 166 if I'm thinking right, something like that. Well, no, whatever, <laughs> do the math on that. Uh, all right, so good question. Uh, another variable uh, aspects of that, you know, I'm gonna talk to you about the diet and we try to put live food, incorporate live food in their diet and, and, and we do that quite a bit. I started to wonder maybe if I was giving them too much brine shrimp. We were hatching live brine shrimp. And I'm wondering, I know what some aquarium fish I've bred, some of them don't process the exoskeleton quite as well. And I was wondering if that was happening with these trout because we did have a year where we were getting bloated stomachs and we were getting some more fish that were popping up dead in the tank than we were accustomed to. Because once you get them past those early stages of development in their feeding, your main boogeyman becomes cannibalism where they start eating each other. But you don't lose too many after that point, but we were losing them. So I backed off big time. In fact, this year I haven't hatched any brine shrimp for them. I'm wondering if there's, they're having an issue digesting that. Uh, as you can see, 12 weeks in, you know, at this point, there's usually, you know, the initial with the kids, you know, the initial development stages, right? The eggs are hatching. That's exciting. They're absorbing their yolk sac. Um, you get some unique genetic mutations in there that make it exciting. And there's death. You know, you're going to have... Um, just fungus will overcome a few of the eggs. It's part of the process. You'll have some individuals, pinheads they call them, where they just simply never learn to eat. Food's in there, they just won't eat. And little by little, their body gets thinner and thinner, hence the word pinhead. Their head looks like the head of a pin, thin little body. Those usually get eaten, but if they, they die, we scoop them out. And we estimate how many fish we have throughout the year just by what we can verify has died in our Tank. You know, if we see a dead one, we take it out. Most of those deaths are happening during the egg stage in that early developmental transition. However, you do get occasional pinheads that die. Once they get to this point, you're not thinking about too many more losses. And we do a lot of journaling with the kids where they do their little trout observation journal. In the early stages, we're doing a lot of it. Once they get up to this size, there's not a ton that's exciting. So we back off on how frequently we do the journaling. Kids can do it whenever they want, coming into class as like seat work or they're finished their work, add to their journals. But official, hey guys, we're gonna cycle through and do the journal. That kind of backs off as the fish get older. 
And you can see they start to get, I don't know if you can see, it might be a little blurry picture, some of the orange dots and stuff. Probably this next photo show that a little bit better. Um, these are fish that are, you know, about seven months old. They, they're pretty much ready to be released. Uh, again, these are pictures that our art teacher photographer took and he, he knew how to work the lighting and everything else. He pulled up some pretty good pictures there. I wish I could do that with my phone. Um, yeah, they're, they're beautiful little fish. Uh, start to get that coloration, the orange and the adipose fin and the dots and stuff. And they're pretty fun. It does. And while, until we were, you know, while we release them, at what point it starts to become more brownish, I don't know, but you know, up until that size, absolutely. Nice colorful fin like that. And these next couple of slides are just simply some pictures of fish. Now, I never had this issue with my computer. This is Murphy's Law, right? That I'm in front of you guys and I'm struggling to get this to advance and I'm not sure why that is, but okay. All right, so again, here's some fish that are pretty close to being released, you know, and even in a 75 gallon aquarium, there's a lot of fish. I mean, at, at one point it feels like you got more fish than water, but we do a lot of water changes. Um, to keep up with that, you know, so just a tank full of healthy trout. Those trout, you know, and they vary in size when they're ready to release, like, you know, just genetics, right? You have some that are maybe that size up to maybe our biggest that are, you know, maybe four and a quarter, you know, those are, those are some beefy ones. We got one right now. It's a good size. Well, we just released them, but the kids come up with names right now. Good luck telling who's who, but that's kind of, that's fun. That's a fun part for us. When one passes away, we're like, oh no, Eddie passed, you know, and we all pretend we know the name of the one that passed away. But there are some unique trout that stand out that we do know their name and uh, everybody know, can recognize them. And I'll show you some of them. All that being the case. So yeah, there's variation with that. Well, um, are we talking about initially, like from? Yeah. Yeah, when we're releasing, so we release into Lake Erie and we go to, we get the permit written for Woodlawn Beach because it's close proximity to our school. Um, now Woodlawn Beach is a state park, which is even better. I can get a Connect Kids to Park grant and they foot the bill, which makes it that much easier. <laughs> Um, but all that being the case, yeah, we're releasing them into the shoreline of Lake Erie and they take off like a dart. The days that we package it, when we, you know, we get them in a couple of buckets, a couple of five gallon Home Depot orange buckets. And, uh, I, you know, I got a fridge in my room with a freezer. So get some ice trays and put an ice tray in each one of them to keep them cool during the transition of taking the bus and getting the kids all loaded up. And obviously when we get to the Creek, that's our priority, but we make sure that water stays cool. And third week of May, the lake's usually right around probably 50 degrees, not too far off uh, shoreline waters. They seem to take right off. You know, you pop them in the water and the kids, we, we, rather than just dump the whole bucket, we try to extend it a little bit. Kids will grab the net and release two, three at a time. And they take right off into the, you know, the ripples and the waves. All right. Although this particular picture, this group, they look pretty uniform in size, but Typically, there's more variation in their growth. I wish this wouldn't be happening right now. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, they get stressed. Going back to your question. Uh, yeah, there's stress in the bucket, right? So you can see they get a lighter color. Their body color overall turns lighter. They get the the pattern the blacks in particular become more pronounced but the rest of them gets a little more washed out that's what i notice and yeah all right yeah it was only a 20 minute drive so they were fine but even though there's no light in that white line Gatorade cooler, they got real, real white. Yeah. Almost no spotting, no par marks, anything like that. So we're putting them in, and within probably 30 seconds, they were modeled. Yeah. And That's a good word for it. No, not the camouflage from the bottom. And it was that quick. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I got a couple pictures of like the release day where you'll see you can see the coloration on the fish. So, pop them out. Here's one getting netted out to be released, and well, I love how those red colors start to pop and stuff. They're they're cute little fish, you know. Yes, sir. Sorry. Hopefully, I didn't step on that. Yeah. All right. So we do come up with genetic mutations and they're pretty cool. This is a common one, this little corkscrew spiral body. Um, I mean, when I say common, we've had some years we get three, two, three, you know, and then over the 11 years we've done this, you know, probably half of those years we've had those corkscrew type mutations and I'd have to assume other ones. Now, I don't know what to call this type of mutation, but it's also one that I haven't seen in the last couple of years, but it was more prevalent early on when we started. Uh, and it, it's, you know, the fish starts to absorb its yolk sac. Like this was initially orange and it starts to absorb the nutrient sac, but it stays there at the same time. It's not shrinking like the rest of them. And ultimately these fish always die. <laughs> they never make it. They don't last much longer than when that nutrient sac is used up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Years ago, the state started introducing new genes, the genes, into the hatching system. Uh, all the ground trout eggs in the United States come from the Rome hatchery. I've been doing 34 years just using stuff from the hatchery. Ah, Rome, all right. 34 generations of inbreeding. There you go. Well, that would explain <laughs> the corkscrews, wouldn't it? Yeah. It could have been something because of how many generations they inbred. Yeah. Well, like I said, that one in particular, I've seen less of it. Uh, so that's good. And maybe they're starting to remedy it. Uh, but like I said, here's some more of these little corkscrew type of deformities. Now, we try to keep these guys going. So when we release the rest of them from the egg sac into the large tank, whenever we got these types of mutations, we're going to keep them in the little egg basket. And we're going to try to drop some of that trout chow so it's like kind of raining on top of their head. And what's pretty cool is they'll take this spiral piece and kind of move it over and pull their body over to get to the food. The most we get them to last is about two, two and a half months. And they usually don't make it past there. But the kids, again, like they like coming up with cool names for the ones they can definitely recognize. And Spiral, uh, Twizzler, uh, some other names like that have been some of the names they've come up with and they're clever and it's cool and it just makes it that much more interesting. You know, that's one of those things that the hook that you need as a teacher. Kids coming into class like, is he alive? How's Corkscrew doing? You know, or whatever the name they gave him that year is. Question. Yes, sir. So as, as stuff, things like this happen, they can even start abnormality events. I mean, then you branch off into like a whole yeah that teachable moment right absolutely so you, you grab onto that and you know you get to refer back to it when you get to those areas in the content but you also take advantage of the opportunity when it shows up yeah absolutely you teach about genetics and then and then you know add that piece about genetic mutations and and maybe segue into sadly enough you know a disease like cancer you know and you know so yeah it's a definitely teachable moment so how about this guy this is this year, first time ever, first time I've ever seen in person a two-headed fish. Yeah. So right off the get-go, we see, I'm like, you know, looking at all these eggs, like double taken, and I'm like, this fish has two heads. Um, I start calling it double header right away. And then uh, and it's it was sticking, but then one of the girls says, you know, can we give him a name? And I'm like, I thought I did. <laughs> Double headers seem like a pretty cool name. But I'm like, yeah. No, I didn't tell her. I thought, you know, I was like, yes, of course. If you guys want to name this fish, let's do it. So they come up with some different names and we voted on it. 
And by the way, I started a trout in the classroom club this year. So after 10 years, it's just something we did in the classroom and it made sense. But we actually started a club to get a group of kids that are really interested in it doing more of the maintenance and the water quality testing. Um, so we kind of turned it into official club this year. Anyhow, so the official club members were, were coming up with names. One kid I thought was clever came up with Wyatt. Why is it? It looks like a Y, right? Shaped like a Y. I thought it was clever. Um, and then two girl, one girl says, uh, I'd like to name it Pearl and Marina, which I had no idea where that was coming from. And then an, I'm like, what's, what's Pearl and Marina? Okay. And I guess it's a cartoon or a game or something. I don't know what. So they voted on it, and that's what won. So that's Pearl and Marina there. And another unique couple of mutations. This one kind of has a C shape to it, bend to its body. This one has, looks like three separate egg sacs. So you get these things, they pop up, they're not unusual. Uh, Double-headed fishes. So we kept that guy going, Pearl and Marina. Um, it actually just had all those different nicknames. People were calling it what they wanted to call it, but uh, we kept it going for a while. I'm trying to remember when it passed. I had the date written down, and kind of it's eluding me now, but I mean, it was going over a month. You know, we kept it going for a while. And uh, for, and I don't even know why I did this, but honestly, I, I froze it. I got in the freezer in my classroom. I'm just like, I just couldn't take myself to flush it. I'm like, that's cool. Double-headed fish. Well, um, yeah, you know, it was just simply, it would have to be right there, right? That's about all you got out of it. It wasn't swimming it wasn't swimming in circles and i got a little bit of video here for you not much let's see how this plays out well that's just a picture of the guy and uh i here let's see if we can see is this gonna load just kind of it breathing it's, and that doesn't seem like it wants to do it for me i was wondering because when i've done presentations in the past it seems like that's always the hold up the little videos for some reason but at any rate, you know, kind of it's funny because one one gills move, then the other gills move, and it's kind of it's back and forth. It's in a little unique rhythm. And you can see their little hearts beating. So I wish I would have played, but it's not a big deal. Once again, we put in a little Petri dish. We put it on the document camera to try to get this photo. So, yes. Now, yes, that person sounded ordinary enough. But you think about something like that? Or? I haven't reached out with them. And maybe, you know, it makes sense. Probably should, right? Can't hurt. They should be aware of it. Chuck, have you heard of any? Any two headed trout coming out of TIC program? Yeah, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, no, it can't be common. Yeah, I told the kids, I'm like, you very well might be like the only classroom with a two headed fish in all of the country, right? Like, what are the chances? Maybe at that time, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Interesting stuff to say the least. I was reading an article actually, so I started looking up two-headed fish after we see this guy. And uh, there was an article, an abstract I read at least, that was saying that they were sampling bass larvae from a pond and they found an unusual number of two-headed bass larvae. So those would be considered larvae. And uh, they attributed it to pesticides in the water at least in that article. So, you know, what led to this? I'm not sure. Well, maybe it's gonna, yeah, you go a little alternating, you know, uh, gill movement there. You probably just barely make out, it's hard to see on the screen, but that little kind of heartbeat in there. Sometimes you can see that pretty well when we project it on the overhead in the classroom. So there's, Pearl and Marina, they died together, unfortunately. All right, so diet. You know, typically Trout Unlimited provides three sizes of trout chow. Zero, which is a powder, one and two. Um, it's my opinion, there should be another size up. Um, two is just too small for the fish when that lasts a month or so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
and inclusive. You have to take good strategies, coordinating all the programs that they have in New York City, and they also distribute the salt food around the other chapters of the state. Okay. They have to so we have they stop yeah, and that's what we end up doing, but we certainly supplement their diet. Yeah, I just think that the fish are at the size they're at. So I actually, uh, and I don't know what size it would fit into, a buddy of mine gave me a, a Ziploc bag full of, it's probably like three quarters of a centimeter size pellet and the reason he gave that to me is like i said we're raising a couple of hatchling snapping turtles this year so that's like part of their diet in addition to a bunch of other stuff and uh so i've been you know we got one the kids named mega this year and i said there's always some that stand out and mega's our cannibal this year that's you know cleaning house we've caught him you know it's cool when you're teaching class all of a sudden whoa and he's like let one just ate one you know and you show up and there's a head sticking out and the kids all crowd around the tank and it's cool so Mega is a cannibal, and and he's eating some of the other ones. So I throw some of those larger pellets in there, and and he's taking those larger ones down. And those things are about three quarter of a centimeter. Most of those would not be able to handle that size, so I'm not recommending that. But three four would be, I think, it'd be nice because the size zero package is huge, and you're just you're never going to feed that to those little fish. Uh, size one, we use pretty much most of that. And size two, we find ourselves running out of it, but I supplement it. So, okay. Yeah, well, we got through. We got through. So, I mean, it's not it's not an urgent thing. It's not an urgent thing. So, we do, uh, we get, you know, I usually get about six or up to eight of these vials of vestigial winged fruit flies. Just to give them live food, you know. Vestigial wing, they don't have the full-on wings, so they're easier to control. You're not... Tape, taking the cap off the culture and having them all around your room. But I have seen in some years when I order these from Ward Scientific, they're labeled as vestigial wings and a lot of them are, but they're not all. So we've had some years where we had some fruit flies cruising about, but in general, um, you know, it, and it's another teachable moment, right? You got all the different stages of metamorphosis. You could see the eggs, you could see the larva and the pupa and then the emerging adults. And you take that little foam cap off and just tap it on the tank. And and they uh, eventually that food source dries up, but you can keep them going a good six to eight weeks, the cultures, before they're used, before they're dried up and you just can't get anything else out of them. But there's many generations of fruit flies and and the trout love them. I should have took a video of that. <laughs> like they just go, they're voracious. It's like a school of bluefish pounding the surface. They just, they come up and they're splashing water on the kids, you know, when you got the tank lit up and they really love those fruit flies. Um, but you know, I've even diced up emerald chiners into small chunks and elite them. Um, now certainly not, uh, cheap is, uh, amphipods and, uh, micey shrimp. Once in a while I could order some live and I, I've dabbled with it, order some live cultures from again, Ward Scientific, which is uh, our science supply company. And you know, the price you pay for a small amount of them isn't worth it. But it's kind of just, it's nonetheless fun to watch a, watch a, eat the live fish and the live food and the kids enjoy it. But a micey shrimp, you can buy those frozen at a, at a pet store. People feed them to their own shrimp, uh, fish. And same with brine shrimp, adult brine shrimp, although we've hatched the eggs and fed them the newly hatched brine shrimp. Um, blood worms, get those frozen, red mosquito larva. And they do end up getting a good amount of wax worms because we have a trout, uh, we have a fishing club, right? So... I'm allergic to earthworms, fun fact. The only guy I ever met in this world allergic to earthworms. So when we do our fishing trips, we're either using fathead minnows or waxworms and then various types of jigs and stuff. So we tend to have some leftover waxworms or myself from the trout or, or ice fishing season and we bring them in and dispose of the extras and the trout appreciate it. They really like the extra, the real food. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Now, every once in a while, and I've, I've done this to myself, where I'm like, well, you know, while I really eat those worm harnesses, I'll wear latex gloves. It never works out. I'm itching and hives, and it's just not worth it. Thanks for that tip. Um, so here is another one. This is a new one for me this year. So got some Elodia. 
uh, Anacris water plant for just microscope work in the classroom. And again, this, I don't know if this is going to load or not. Yeah, there we go. Um, and, you know, I had it from last year's microscope work, and I threw it in this big, clear, late, you know, plastic pickle drum thing. And uh, you could see it got overtaken by algae. But in addition to that, wherever they come from, I guess, obviously, the Anacris, there must have been some, some Daphnia water flea eggs or something. And they're doing great. So they're doing good. They've been sitting in that classroom on the windowsill since last year. And, you know, so now I'll just come up with a little, like, plastic ketchup-like container and dip it under the surface. It fills up with the, the water fleas and dump that in the tank. And they're small enough that you can't really see them floating through the water. But you know they're trying to eat them because they're all positioned with their head into the current and they take off and grab one and get back into the current. So they're enjoying the live food sources. And, you know... Me and Chuck have talked about this over the years, like how many of these fish survive? And there's no way to know. Maybe they all get eaten that day that you release them. I mean, heck, where we're releasing them, shoreline and Lake Erie, there's all types of walleye in the shallows, the smallmouth bass, and everything else, right? Gobies, everything likes to eat these little guys. However, I'd like to believe that by feeding them real live food sources, they got to avoid the big cannibals in the tank. Maybe they're learning a thing or two about living in the wild. I don't know. We'll never know that. I'm trying to advance that slide. There we go. Oop. Go back one. It's just, uh, these are stock photos. These are not my photos, but this is just what it looks like when you're hatching brine shrimp. You get an air stone in there, you really get it oxygenated and uh, really move in that current and ultimately get the appropriate mix of salt and, and water and bingo, hatch them out. So, you know, this is a stage that we would be feeding them to the young trout. And if you're buying them at the pet store frozen, they're the adult stage and they're probably, you know, a quarter inch or so at that point. And like I, I alluded to, I started to correlate that feeding too much brine shrimp seemed to be causing us some issues. So I got away from that. Maybe if I did it more sparingly, but when you go through the process of hatching it out, you got all these little shrimp, tend to feed them more heavily. And I think that was a no-no is what I've learned in the, in the long run. Probably not even worth it since we started to notice that. So I was talking about cannibalism and it's something that's always going to happen. And you, I don't know if you can see the little tails hanging out of their mouths and uh, usually a little head lodged into the belly. Um, these are some of the better photos. You know, I, this happens very frequently and it's really hard to get a good photo of it. Man, just, I, I've probably spent maybe a couple hours <laughs> over the years if I put it all together, like just turn the right way and they, they just won't give you a good shot and there's other fish in the way and it's it's hard to get the photos, but again, our guy, Mr. Copaz, who retired recently, was able to show up and get a couple good photos. And I'll show you one of my not so good ones here in a second. <laughs> Maybe a couple of mine. These are like cell phone pics, right? Um, same thing. You got some mouth. Here's one that took it backwards. You see the head and the little eyes there. But um, it's something that happens. And, and the loaves are little fish. Like these aren't even big ones. Uh, the bigger ones, once they start predating the smaller tank mates, like they go down. They just eat them. But, you know, when they're this big they're still eating each other it's pretty amazing to see you know how does a a fish that's one and a quarter inches eat one that's one and an eighth but they figure it out it takes them a little bit to get it down yeah i mean the whole back half of the fish yeah yeah left their own devices that's what i'll do i guess i was uh years ago i was i was ice fishing in quaker lake for pike and we were using some larger suckers, like nine inch suckers, seven and a half to nine inch range. I ended up catching like not a very big brown trout. I don't remember how, I mean, about that big on a big old sucker. I couldn't believe it on a, on a tip down, you know, or a, well, yeah, well, not the brownie, <laughs> probably true. Yeah. Uh, but I did not. <laughs> I released the brown trout and we had the suckers and yeah, I haven't been doing that in many years, but it was, it was a big, a big sucker for a brown to take like that. Yeah, Mark, absolutely. Just seen me the other night. Yeah. 
And that's what inspired me talking to Mark. He hasn't been there in years, but Mark got a real fat 43 incher out of there. That's a nice northern pike around here. But even you catch little pike, their their stomachs are just oh they're obese. They're just filling up on fatty trout, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're predators. You know, I know from raising fish, there's one of the fish species. Some fish species are more uh, prone to that cannibalism than others is one alto lamprologus compressiceps and also calvis that just it's hard to raise them they absolutely eat each other up <laughs> you know you'd start out and you're like you know and, and when you're breeding them you're thinking like it's nice to get the money when you sell them when they get the sale size you know and start out with 100 and you end up with like 23 they just keep eating each other uh yeah yeah and it doesn't well a couple things like i was gonna say it doesn't matter how well you keep them fed and i, I believe that to be true at the same time like it's worth talking about is vacations right like you're raising trout in the classroom but there's spring break there's winter recess there's you know the long weekends um the long weekends for which four day weekends i just leave the fish um, it gets sketchy if they're newly hatched, like they need to eat frequently. That's, that's a long way to go four days for a newly hatched fish. I might try to get in and talk to the maintenance guys over the weekend and something like that. But in most cases, once the fish have been eaten for a while, four days is nothing I'm not concerned about, but I do get, uh, automatic feeders for the week long breaks, set it up. So it's, it'll feed them once every 12 hours. And because of that, I'll leave a dim light on the tank so that, you know, if, if the light's out and it dumps food in there, it's just going to settle the bottom and rot. One thing I know is about these fish is you overfeed them. If the food's going in the gravel, that's where it stays. They're not going to forage too much through the gravel or the bottom of the tank. It has to be floating around on the surface or in the current. And once it gets down in there, it's, it's just going to rot. So that's not good for water quality. So I leave that dim light on. They're fed once every 12 hours, absolutely feeding them less is war way better than feeding them more. So they're eating lean during those breaks, but they're eating. That being the case, more often than not, I come back and just looking at the tank, you could tell you are you have less. Some years, if you got a, one or two of those bigger cannibals in there, you come in and there's noticeably less fish. But sometimes you can't tell, but you suspect so much that they're, they're going to eat. It happens. Um, so yeah, this is our current setup here. Again, this is the latest room that I'm in. This is the first room we started with, and there is another room in between, but, um, yeah, here the girls are working with their, it looks like there's a bag of food out and they're filling out their, uh, observation logs and they draw pictures. And, uh, when they do water quality testing, they'll write down the parts per million of ammonia and nitrites and stuff like that. More just observations with their journals. Hey, there's that other room. So you just seen three of the rooms I had this this set up in. And there's a peekaboo door thing that we used to use, but we kind of got away from it at this point. Yeah, here's just a quick look at the journal. I was working with one of my blended special ed teachers years ago, and she came up with this. It was the first version, and I said, all right, that's our trout journal. I haven't changed it since. So a little cut out there, the life cycle, and... See, this is just one of our kids, you know, grabbed one and, you know, they got down the uh, number of eggs or fry. Uh, when we're calculating those numbers as they make observations, we're just tallying what we can confirm has passed away to come up with the numbers. Uh, this is earlier this year, October 17th. We still got 199. Um, we're never counting them. <laughs> Good luck with that. Water temperatures in Fahrenheit and Celsius, a little diagram, whatever words they want to use. And... Uh, you know, a little bit here, sloppy writing on this chick, but that's okay. A little bit about ammonia and nitrites and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, I see she put a couple notes about the turtle tank water quality as well. And here I see some kids just doing their water testing, water quality testing, and, uh, you know, diverse. We have a diverse school population. I mean, and it's changing by the day. Holy crud, we're getting them from all over. But, you know, we got students from, the Middle East, various countries, and West Africa, and and just got another one from Cuba and uh, and uh, Argentina. Like we have a very diverse district, which is great. 
Uh, but you know, you got all these different unique cultures that are getting, you know, accustomed to trout and just hopefully earning a respect for the outdoors and being good stewards of the environment, which is a big part of what we do, what we try to instill in them. And then, you know, another way, again, getting kids involved, right? Cause that's what it's about. It's about the kids. And, uh, here's just some student artwork and, you know, this one was elicited. I asked a student, a couple students, uh, like, hey, you know, let's, if anyone's interested, some extra credit, draw a trout, you know, life cycle. And, you know, and then you get some kids that'll turn it and get a little extra credit. And, you know, this is just something that one of the, he actually, this, this young man came up with about 10 of these pictures, you know, eight and a half by 11. And he's like, hey, Mr. Miller, I made these for you, you know? And I was like, that was pretty cool. There's one of them, you know, uh, trout, keep it <laughs> pretty cool. So again, I like to see that artistic aspect of the kids or just whatever, whatever they're into, you know, um, it's seldom does it become a situation where all the kids in the classroom are just excited about the trout, right? Everybody has their own thing that makes them tick. You get a handful of kids that are really into it. You get some kids that can kind of take it or leave it, but some days they're more interested than others. And then you get some that that's that loud thing in the corner. You know, you can't please them all, but you know, um, just like in the classroom, you find out what makes the kid tick and some kids really like artwork. So this is a way that they were able to connect to the program. And again, little trout life cycles. These are larger diagrams that they've, they've made and they contribute to it. And, and uh, uh, we talked about earlier incorporating into the content and, you know, it's a life science course. We're talking about ecology and predator prey relationships and energy and ecosystems and all that. And it gives us an opportunity always to refer back to the trout. And uh, this is just one thing I figured I'd throw up here, a little challenge I gave the kids. They got the different classification schemes of the trout and the challenges, write the scientific name in the appropriate fashion. So they should have a capitalized letter for Salmo and the genus and the lowercase truta. And uh, just, you know, you find little ways to incorporate it into the content. So this is the next, you know, really big day, right? We're going to start catching the trout and getting them ready for release. And over the years, there's a few different pictures. Uh, you can see generally the size of some of the fish that are in the tank at that point. And uh, they get excited. Everybody takes turns, you know. All right, you scooped a few. Now it's the next kid gets to scoop a few. And got somebody else tallying up the numbers and stuff and doing some measurements to get some generous, general base line size and stuff like that. And there's a different day of collecting the trout here we took out the you know the, the rocks and the driftwood and all that to just make it easier for the kids to catch them see a little bit of our unique population there and then of course the big release right uh here you get an idea one of the kids holding one there about the general size of them when they get released and um you know it's still it's usually may lake's pretty cold but uh, never seem to find a shortage of kids that are willing to take their shoes and socks off and walk into a foot of water to release them, you know. So, um, hey, they're game to do it. It's funny, and I, I tell them not to, right? I'm like, if you're going to be near the water, you know, either stand back or take your shoes off. And it, inev inevitably, there's always a kid that just gets so wrapped up in the moment, and now they're, like, standing in water with their shoes on. Like, hey, back off. You're getting wet. And, you know, I'm a sucker for these pictures because it's just good memory. So I got a few here. <laughs> uh, Woodlawn Beach, of course, and just uh, definitely enjoy these. So we, 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 when I started Trout in the Classroom, which is also when I started the fishing club, our school district came up with what they called Steeler Service Day. They wanted us to come up with an opportunity to give back to the community, right? And made great sense to me. So I just segued the trout we were raising and do the way we're going to give back to the community. We're going to go to the local beach. We're going to do a beach sweep and clean up all the trash and everything that drifts ashore and all the litter. We're going to release the trout for local fishermen, hopefully to partake in someday. And then from there, you know, we do a scavenger hunt, play some can jam, toss some football, soccer ball, great day. That's just some of our, uh, that's what it used to be. Now the district got away from it. In fact, I noticed it was on the calendar, but not one person mentioned it. And that day just passed, Steelers Service Day. But these things happen, right? In school districts, sometimes you got to change. But um, we still do it uh, to some extent or another. 
uh, just again. And in fact, this particular, so, so it's changed over the years. It was an official Steelers service day and the district was prov providing the bus. And that was, that was another reason I did it on Steelers service day. All right, we're going to have a bus. We don't have to worry about the logistics of paying for it. Um, and it worked out good, but they got rid of it. So then Woodlawn became a state park. Cool. Connect kids to parks. Um, wasn't a big official Steelers service day, but still was able to, you know, get a permission for a field trip. And this was actually, um, Two years ago, uh, I it was that that was two years ago. And that was just like the fishing club. That particular year, uh, our fishing club was going to Chestnut Ridge, and we're like, we're gonna stop, we're gonna release the trout, and then we're gonna make our way to Chestnut Ridge for a fishing trip. So we've seen a few different versions of it, and like I had mentioned earlier, for Earth Day this year, we joined with a bunch of other schools. There was quite a bit of kids. Um, we released the trout, but we did the beach sweep with all the other schools instead of just our own. That was an interesting day because for whatever reason, the news, the media that were at the at the beach were really, I don't know what it was, but they were drawn to our students. And a bunch of our kids were all over the news. They were in the Buffalo Evening News. They were on three different TV stations. Uh, for whatever reason, they were given a lot of interviews and it was pretty cool. So it was nice to get that, you know, that positive look. In fact, one of the uh news people whatever you call them <laughs> she uh she gave me her number and she's like if you and i told her like we're only releasing 75 we got another batch still back at the school we're gonna release and she was like wanted to do an exclusive with us and i should have followed through but i, I didn't honestly so anyhow you know we are talking about you're talking about coloration are the fish stressed when they're being released and then the different from going from the aquarium to a bucket here's one of the couple buckets we'll bring and you could see that modeling Chuck referred to. I was talking about how their bodies get light, but the darker colors get pronounced. But, you know, pulling one out with wet hands, we don't try to handle them too much, but a little bit during the day. Most of them are in the net when they release them. Once in a while, a kid wants to put it in their wet hands and release it. But there's the coloration on them. I mentioned that orange adipose fin. Still got it going strong there. And just providing community service. Once again, some of these beach sweeps, uh, some years they've yet to get all the wood, the driftwood out of there and other years they have. What a you know, drastic difference. I swear the one year we get there and they had these big payloaders and tractors with wheels taller than me. And we get there and the park manager's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, just, you know, there's going to be some big trucks and dump trucks and tractors and stuff. Just yeah. Stay away from them. I'm like, I got 62 kids with me. And, they, and there's these trucks are zooming all up and down the beach. And I thought someone was going to get killed, but it all worked out in the end. Um, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> That's exactly what should, I mean, we were looking around. Uh, it, was, it was a unique day. But we all made it through unscathed. That was a good one. Well, let me go back one. Uh, you know, and I, I threw a lot of these pictures and just good times, you know, drawn in the sand or different groups and girls out there cleaning up a bunch of trash. We've done this over the years. You know, it's funny is that every year, you know, we give them read them the riot act. I'm like, we're not picking up dead animals like <laughs> you're likely to find dead fish and we're not picking anything like that up. Just, you know, don't pick up wood and anything natural. Leave it there. Just plastic and trash and. Every year, somebody comes up with a big old, like, and they got latex gloves on, but this, like, big dead catfish. Like, what do you want me to do with this, Mr. Miller? Like, put it down and get away from it. Big musky or the one year was a half-dead, uh, what do you call those, mud puppy things? Yeah. A big old salamander thing. And I'm like, oh. And then the kicker was way down the beach, closer to the, the creek itself, there was a, a dead deer. So, oh, uh, yeah, big dead deer. And as you got close, you're like, ooh, it was humming. It smelled horrible. And Kids are like, Mr. Miller, what should we do with the deer? <laughs> I'm like, do you listen to me? Stay away from the dead animals, man. Don't pick them up. Yeah, well, then, then you know, that's the good thing about any time you're in the, in the outdoors with the, the kids, you know, whether it be fishing club or a trout release, like, you know, everything that's a, those teachable moments, right? The turkey vultures and the ospreys and, and everything and anything. What kind of fish is that? And the other funny thing is I learned over the years, again, you know, a lot, a lot of these kids, they live in Lackawanna, New York. Most of them are within a couple miles from the shoreline of Lake Erie, but it's hidden by the steel plant, right? So you tell them where you're going, like, a lot. <laughs> we talk about these things, Lake Erie and 
We're going to get one of the Great Lakes. And then you get there, and inevitably, I got a kid or two saying, like, is this the ocean? I'm like, no, 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 no. No, it's Lake Erie, remember? And is this salt water? No, no, no. It's it's one of the Great Lakes, you know? And But they just, and they don't even realize it's there, a lot of them. You know, not all of them, some of them. It's interesting. Uh, all right. So, future goals. Pretty much done here. Thanks for your time. But, you know, this is something that's still one of the things I'm thinking about I'd like to potentially do is the aquaponics aspect of it. I, I do gardening. We've oftentimes uh, got away from it the last couple of years because I'm sharing my classroom. <laughs> I say my classroom because I'm used to having my own. But now there's a couple of two, three other classes in there throughout the day. And it's hard to leave a bunch of stuff and not have it messed with. I got to tell you, the kids have been great with the trout. They really, I mean, I mean, it's been very few and far between. I find like a penny or something in the tank, and it's been pretty harmless. But when I was raising, when we were raising the garden plants, that was a little bit different. When we transitioned and people would be in and out of the classrooms, I noticed they're breaking the stems or pinching them, like and not in front of me, but like other classes coming in. So kind of got away from it. But I'd like to, you know, potentially utilize the nitrates from the fish pump it up into you know aquaponics, pump it up into like a hydroponic type situation, excuse me, so the plants are pulling the nitrites out and ultimately returning fresh water. This makes it a sustainable system if you're doing it right. Um, you know, that's, in keeping the trout, their main waste product is ammonia and that's harmful, right? So you're gonna keep a, keeping an aquarium is about keeping a healthy bacterial culture. That bacteria is gonna consume the ammonia and break it down into nitrites, still harmful, but less harmful. Another set of bacteria gonna eat the nitrites and break that into nitrates. Can't get rid of nitrates unless you're doing water changes, so you do those. But with this type of setup, the plants benefit from the nitrates, it's nutrients for them. They'll absorb it from the water. And ideally, you don't have to do water changes. Sounds pretty cool. And you're producing hopefully vegetables and in a smaller space and pumping them out. And I'd like to try to get that going someday. So that's, you know, the plumbing is what are the space, right? You think what are the obstacles? Space, the plumbing aspect of it, but PVC and probably pull it off, you know, it's not going to be that hard. So who knows? That might be the next step is doing a little bit of aquaculture. And another bucket list item, and I thought about that coming up here is that. And Chuck, I reached out to you about this, um, potentially trying to raise a different type of trout. You know, like brown trout aren't native to the area from Europe, right? I think they were introduced in the 1800s. So I think it'd be great to raise lake trout or brook trout, where now it's a conservation effort. And I think I just, I like the ring of that. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, it's been 11 years for me raising brown trout and I love it and I love fish. However, it would be cool to have that unique little change of pace uh, with Lakers, which we could release right in Lake Erie. Brown or brook trout, you know, there's real no brook trout around us and we don't need a two hour bus ride. I think it's pricey and time consuming. So like lake trout would be really interesting to me, for me in particular. Now it's a funny, cause I have a little do now warm up. The kids come into the classroom and there's bell work, like a, a do now question based on the previous day's lesson. But today the do now was, um, Something to the effect of, um, you think it's worthwhile for us to do the trout in the classroom program again next year for next year's seventh graders, and uh, and then why, right? There was no negative feedback. Everybody who answered the question, you know, and shared their answer. I mean, they write it down, but then you get some volunteers to share it. They were all like, yes, like I'm like, well, why? And they're like, well, it's just it's fun watching them grow. And they brought up the two-headed fish and the cool experience there. And, of course, the kids that seen cannibalism stuff brought that up. But they all had good things to say. But the one girl, Leah, says, you know, Mr. Miller, so if we do it next year, she's like, we did brown trout this year. Maybe we could do a different fish species. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I've been, been it's kind of something I've been thinking about too, Leah. So Trout Unlimited people heard, <laughs> heard my wish list item. I'd love to see if you can... If we could work that out, if logistically it can make sense. And I think that's one of the big barriers is the lake trout hatcheries aren't in close enough proximity. Chuck already does enough driving. <laughs> we don't need to send them any further. No? Okay. And what's the thought? Do you know the rationale on that? They may be, they may be some 
I'm not sure. I think maybe it's the hotel that it's at. Yeah, from what I do understand is you can only get a permit to release them where they currently stock that species, right? So if stock brown trout are being stocked in the Lake Erie, we could release them there. Or 18 Mile Creek, they could release them there. That's my understanding. I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. Right. Lake Charles is a state stock. They come up with Warren. The federal hatchery. They don't have. Where is it located? They have Warren, Pennsylvania. Oh, Warren. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. So that was a thought, you know. Okay. Yeah, again, the proximity issue, but yeah. Interesting, though. Inspected for VHS or whatever else they could imagine that they could potentially. Yeah, and that's and it makes sense. And and don't get me wrong, I don't want to come off as ungrateful. We love the raising a brown trout. It's just like you know those bucket list things you think about over the years. But we're very you know I'm happy with the brown trout program. And I'll tell you what, like for me, you know the kids leave like being a middle school teacher is it's a trip. <laughs> uh, all that being the case, all right, all the, yo, I got about 120 plus kids on my rosters throughout the day coming out of my classroom. And then you have a lot of other contact time. So you get a little downtime in your room and you know, what brings my blood pressure down and gives me some peace is looking at the aquarium. Like I love fish. I love fishing for them. I've been raising fish since I was a little kid and breeding them. So I just get to kind of get my little Zen moment and get right back at it. You know? So I do value that. All right, some pros and cons, something to consider. Obviously, great experiences for the kids. There aren't too many kids watching brown trout develop in the classroom. You're getting kids out in the outdoors and all those teachable moments that come of it and the experience of being on the lake with their classmates, good times. Um, something important to me, building value for wildlife in the outdoors. Uh, both the fishing club and the trout on in the classroom club, we have a motto, cleaner than we found it. Wherever we go, we will not leave any of our trash, and I make sure of it, but they, they understand that. Um, but kids are kids. You know, they might hope oh, that water bottle pop <laughs> top over there, but I won't let them forget it. But then on top of it, whenever we're leaving, we grab some bags. We're just going to grab any discarded litter on our way out. So wherever we go, we leave it cleaner than we found it. And obviously, Woodlawn Beach, you've seen those pictures where we do that. But in the Fisher Club and everything else. Um, so again, hopefully teaching them to be good stewards of the environment is what I'm getting at um what else do we got there yeah like i mentioned earlier that little anticipatory set that hook that gets the kids wanting to come in the classroom i think it's valuable uh to get the kids feeling good about coming to science class and you know another reason for the field trip my uh my master's thesis was on place-based education field trips you know so the clubs i'm running the trout in the classroom it gives me lots of opportunities to get the outdoors with kids and i'm always looking for that opportunity for the next field trip i'm trying to feel out my administration to see what, what didn't they think enough is enough. <laughs> I got four under my belt this year, um, besides just school ran field trips. Uh, and I'm looking for maybe one more before we're done. Um, and then just accountability for behavior and grades. Like I'm certainly not gonna take a student that can't control themselves in the classrooms and in the hallways, they're getting written up, they're getting suspended. Like there's some accountability. So. You know, some not every, it's not going to hook everybody, but there are certainly kids that are going to improve their behaviors, improve their grades in order to participate in the trout release and and definitely the fishing club as well. Like you can't be failing your courses, getting in trouble throughout the building and think we're going to take you on a trip. So I see and, and, and in my opinion, in a lot of ways, there's not enough accountability lately in education, but they have accountability with me and. I hold them to those things. And it's, those are those tough conversations. Like you're about ready to go on the trip. And then I get your eligibility form back and I see that you're failing two courses. 
or I, you know, seen that situation where you kind of lost control. And when I tried asking you to do the right thing, you weren't listening to me. And, you know, so you have to have those conversations and kick kids off trips, but they, they change their behavior. You know, like I see those failing grades turn into eighties and I see those kids improve their behaviors. And then I enjoy a nice day out on the water with them. So it works. Uh, cons, the chiller unit's pretty loud. Uh, I used to have some classrooms that were pretty large and it was less of an issue, but they were unusually large, the one of them in particular. So the trout tank was way behind the classroom area and it wasn't an issue, but my classes and as big now. So there's a few, we got like table setups in the classroom, two kids per table. And, you know, you got a good two, three table zone, six kids seats that are close to that. And it's kind of loud, you know, and I know when I go back there and I'm circulating around the classroom and somebody from the front of the classroom is answering a question and it gets hard to hear them. So there's an issue. So I thought about building a little like muffler kind of foam box around it or something. I've never done that, but uh, obviously if then it, it, evaporation is not a huge issue because the water's cold, so it's not evaporating too fast, but it will. So that water level gets a little lower. You start to get that water return from the filter. That could be a little loud too, but you know, you just keep it, you got to keep the water level up. Not a big deal. The food smells and we fit them th frequently throughout the day. We didn't talk about that, but you know, we're feeding them very, I'm probably feeding them once an hour when they're newly hatched fish that have absorbed their yolk sac. But even throughout the day, they're, they're eating five, six times a day. I mean, nothing, they're going to consume everything within just less than a minute. We'll come back later and feed them some more. I mean, they're voracious. They just keep eating. So we eat, feed them throughout the day, but you know, you open up the baggie and it's like, Ugh, smells like fish. And sometimes, you know, the tank might smell a little bit more than you want, but we keep that under wraps pretty good. That's infrequently. We got to keep up with the water changes and stuff or else it will probably smell pretty foul. Um, condensation is unique this time of the year. Uh, as it starts getting warmer, you get those high humidity days. Like it's just dripping. Now I got, I think you've seen in some of those pictures, I got a black apron that goes around the base of the tank. That's helped me out a lot. Before I had that there, like literally there's a puddle on the wall on the ground. It could be potentially dangerous. There's so much condensation going on with that cold water on a hot, humid day. Now you see that apron and literally like there's a huge swath of it that's soaking wet, but at least it catches it and it allows it to evaporate. But it's challenging even to see in the tank during those high humidity days, but it's a pretty good barometer for what's going on in the weather. Uh, maintenance requirements, of course, are gonna require maintenance. And if you don't have a room with a, with a uh, water source, that could be a challenge. The first, the first, Two rooms I kept them in did not have a sink. And thank goodness I have three sinks, so four sinks, because including the back room right now. So that makes it a lot easier to do water changes. And even while I was on the upper level, I would use a siphon long hose and I put it out the window to the grass. Just let, let gravity take over and the grass would benefit from that. And in fact, I use this water to water the plants and stuff in the classroom too. They do really well with it. And uh, just, you know, if you're in a district that's moving your room around a lot, I've you know, I've moved too many times in my opinion, but the tank's been at least three rooms now. And, you know, I think I've been in a total of five rooms since I've been there, which is a lot of rooms. All right. So those are some of the pros and cons that I could think of. And I just always like that picture. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good one from one of our trout releases, but I don't know. It just kind of resonated with me. I had it hanging on the wall for a while and I figured I'd throw it in there for the end. Any questions? We good? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's good. I appreciate you guys inviting me out here. It's good meeting you guys. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.